Hey, it's Clay. Welcome to another video. This is going to attempt to be a educational or explanation of clipping, how it works in guitar pedals and also even amplifiers. Uh, I would say that overdrive and distortion fuzz, whatever you want to call it, is some of the most important and impactful elements of guitar tones. The reasons why we love it is is almost you know it's impossible to to take clipping out of that equation. So I want to do a little bit of a dive deeper into what is happening with clipping, kind of cut through some of the marketing BS and equip you guys with some knowledge. So whether you're just curious to learn more about what's happening in your favorite pedal, or if you're a DIYer and you want to experiment with some of this in your own circuits, I think this can help with that. So uh, first and foremost, understand that there are a lot of different ways to clip a signal. Now, I'm going to talk about one of the more common ways to do it, and I've got the tube screamer here up as a representation of that. And we're going to talk about diode clipping. Now, when I refer to diode clipping, I'm referring to the use of obviously diodes, but I'm also going to lump into that the use of transistors and overloading a transistor, because as I understand it, in a crude way, a transistor is basically a pair of diodes uh, in a little bit of a different fashion. But I think it's the same basic concept that would apply to both, just in a little bit of a slightly different manner. So let's talk about what is a diode and how does it work. A lot of the time, the way that electricity and its flow is described is, is using an analogy of water. And a diode is a perfect way to understand that. When you're looking at this river here, this beautiful picturesque river, with some nice photography, uh, it's kind of a slow shutter speed it looks like, the uh, direction of the flow of water is coming from upstream to downstream. So it is flowing in one direction. You don't have two streams of flow, right, with some of the water going up and some of the water going down or vice versa. It's only going in one way. And you want to think with that a diode does the same thing. It's a one-way valve and it only allows the current to flow in one direction and it stops the current from flowing back in the opposite direction. So to understand how this works, you basically want to take what we were just looking at and flip it on its side. This is a sine wave. A representation of a sine wave is as you, as you would look at it if you've ever recorded music and zoomed in on it. If you've recorded your guitar tone and you zoom in really close, this is what you will see. A sine wave, um, you know, it, it could be your guitar signal or anything. This is basically alternating current. And when I say alternating, I'm referring to how this portion goes up and then it crosses this halfway point right here, and then this portion goes down. So the portion that goes up is going in one direction, and then it alternates and it goes down, that is going in a different direction. So the diode, if you have put a diode onto this signal, only one half of the signal, meaning either the positive or the negative, is going to be allowed to flow. So if you put a diode such that, you know, in typically diodes look like this, where you've got a line and a triangle, and you can flip it. it it's, it's directional. It's, or you can flip its orientation. So in, in one direction, this means that whenever the signal reaches this point, it doesn't pass, and then, oh, now it's okay. It can go back down. It's good to go. It's good to go. Oh, doesn't want to pass. So it will stop like that. So again, the diode is allowing it to flow. Whenever it goes negative, it's allowed to go. Whenever it goes positive, then it's blocked. Now, the next thing to be aware of, though, is that diodes are not perfect. This center line is zero. Uh, and so the way I drew it previously would be if a diode was operating perfectly, meaning the moment that it crossed into the blocked direction, it was getting blocked entirely. But that's not really how a diode works. What you want to think about is the higher that you go up, the more amplitude that you have. That basically means you have more voltage. And a diode is not perfect. And so it actually has a point at which it begins to do its job. And this is referred to as the forward voltage specification. Every diode has a forward voltage that is designed to work at. So, for example, let's just say this is 1, 1.0, and this is 0. Okay, so, and then, you know, obviously this would be 0. 0.5, 0. 
we'll just for ease of use, we'll, we'll use those numbers. Okay, so let's say that our diode has a forward voltage of 0.7. So right here. That means that with this current example, this sine wave would never actually clip because this is only at about 0.6. So it would never cross over this threshold to go beyond the forward voltage point and start clipping. Well, now, instead, let's say we're at 0.3, and we're right here. So that means that the signal is going to go up, and then right when it hits this point, all of this is going to get clipped by the diode. And then everything else is going to... It's, it's basically going to get shut off here, and it's going to get clipped. And then once it comes back down, it's good to go. And then again, this whole part of the signal is going to get clipped off and all the way on through. So the forward voltage is a pretty important thing to understand when you're talking about your diode. You know, this is determining the point at which the clipping is going to start happening. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit more and refer back to that. But just remember that with the forward voltage, however high or low it is, that's pretty important to uh, where we're at in the signal. So now at this point, I want to take a look at a schematic of a tube screamer provided by ElectroSmash. Thank you for that. And specifically, I want to point you to this part of the section. You can see there are two diodes right here. Okay, this is a feedback loop. And the we have two diodes. One is in one direction, one is in the other. So that means we have clipping being applied to both the positive waveforms and the negative waveforms. And as you can see, uh, there's actually, it has a path to ground right here. So what that means, let's go back to our sine wave. What that means, in effect, is, let's, say our, our, so let's just say our forward voltage is 0.5, okay? So... What's going to happen is the diode is going to receive the signal that's going to come in. The signal is going to come in. It's going to go pass into the diode. And whatever portion is up here is going to pass through that forward voltage. And that portion of the signal is going to get clipped off. And it's going to get sent to ground. So it basically disappears. It gets clipped off. Imagine like a machete chopping a tree in half, and then that top part gets thrown away. And then the rest of the signal, and again, it's it, there. there's also a negative portion over here. So when it comes back down, it hits this point, and this gets chopped off and sent to ground, and so on and so forth. Chops off that peak, sends it to ground. Chops off that peak, sends it to ground. On and on we go. And so... Instead of your sine wave going up and to this point, it gets reaches that forward voltage point and gets chopped off of its wave and it gets, and it gets, gets sent to ground. And this chopping is, is what is referred to as clipping. So this is physically what is happening to your waveform when the signal runs through these diodes. It gets clipped. So now let's go back to our schematic, and you can see here how there are two diodes. Now this is a schematic of the Baz fuss. You can see we've got our diode right here, but I like to point out that this is just the Lone Ranger. This is just a solo diode. So let's go back to our sine wave, and let's clear it off, and let's analyze what's happening here. So now we've got our diode here that's clipping this portion but there's no diode facing the other direction. So that means that the negative waveforms are being able to pass completely freely. So only these positive forms are getting clipped. This is referred to as asymmetrical clipping. Actually, I'm not even sure if this is asymmetric because frankly, it's, you know, it's not that they're being clipped differently. It's one is being clipped and one is not being clipped at all. And then compare that to are two diodes in parallel with one another. They're both the same diode, so they are going to clip the signal 
in a perfectly even fashion. Perfectly symmetrical, same on both positive and negative. Let's take it a step further. And one other trick that sometimes people do is they will add another diode. So if you put another one in series, so now we've got two diodes here on top, one diode on bottom. This is referred to as asymmetrical clipping. What that does, let's go back to our schematic. Remember I said if you've got one diode, maybe it's got a 0.5 forward voltage, 0.5, Okay, now we've added another one that's going to take this top and lower it down even further because these two diodes in series are going to compound on one another. Now, I'm being a little bit general, but you're basically you're getting rid of this top. So you're getting rid of this top line and you are changing it so you really only have this lower line because the two diodes have stacked on one another. Their forward voltage has compounded on one another. So now if we've got maybe 0.5 over here, maybe we've got 0.3 over here. So now again, we clip this, we clip this, we clip this, we clip this, and this, and this, and you can see that they're being clipped differently. These, these positive peaks have a greater amount of clipping going on than the bottom peaks. So that is our asymmetrical clipping. It's different. The, the positive is being treated differently than the bottom. Both are being clipped but in an in unequal and asymmetrical manner. Okay, so now let's take a step back and look a little bit more closely at this difference between symmetrical and asymmetrical clipping. In order to do that, we need to talk about harmonics. Harmonics, as in harmony. If you've ever done any singing, you may know that harmony is when you stack multiple voices on top of one another, right? You've got your primary maybe your melody, and then your harmony adds another layer, or maybe a couple of layers, right? You know, barbershop quartet would be four layers. Uh, you know, sometimes you have a, a like a, a fancy choir that could do even more than that. Um, or even just a simple harmony, right, where you've got a primary melody and then a secondary harmony. You know, the, there's as, as many as you want, but those are all harm, harm, harmonies. Those are all harmonies in the same way that are harmonic is adding or stacking tones on top of one another. It's the same concept. So when the signal is clipped, as we looked at here, this part of the signal gets clipped. What that also does is it generates or creates harmonics, which is essentially stacking notes on top of one another. And to exemplify that, I made this Reddit post a while back, and I'll leave a link if you want to read through it. But basically, I stumbled into this concept kind of as an accident. What I did is I created a sine wave using a sine wave generator in my uh, digital audio workstation. I created a C note, which I believe is 260 hertz. And you can see that this is providing a visual depiction. You can see right here between 200 and 300, you've got this big green bulge. That's showing that we've got a tone at 260 hertz. Then what I did is I, after this... I added a guitar amplifier simulation to that signal, and I turned up the gain in different ways. And so I'm adding clipping through a, a plug-in simulation. And as you can see, what happened is not only do we still have this first pitch, which I'm going to refer to as the fundamental, but now you have all these additional spikes that are popping up. These are harmonics. So as the signal is clipped, it is generating these additional spikes, these harmonics, these harmonies, these layers of voices. And again, if you think about it, right, this may be if in the terms of a choir. Maybe this is your bass. Then here's your baritone. Then your alto. Then your soprano or, or whatever. You know, you're layering voices on top of one another to create a chord. That's basically what's happening when you run a dry guitar signal into an amplifier that's going to clip or into a pedal that's going to clip. Same concept no matter what. And as we look at this image, I want you to take a step back and think practically, and I'm going to make generalizations here, but think practically when you're playing guitar. What kinds of things do players gravitate towards when you're playing a clean guitar, aka no harmonic distortion, contrasted with an overdriven guitar, a fuzzed guitar, lots of harmonic distortion? 
generally, I would think that the clean guitar might be better suited to playing chords or playing arpeggios where you're stacking notes on top of one another. You know, a full six-string chord on a clean guitar sounds nice. Whereas if you're going to play with a lot of distortion, I would say that generally players tend to gravitate towards simpler chords like power chords. A power chord is really just two notes, maybe a, an octave, a repeat of one of them, but it's really just two notes. Or if you're soloing, you know, having distortion on your solo tone while you're playing single notes is really, really pleasing. And the big, one of the big reasons for that is look at what's going on here. Say you're playing your power chord, your C, this is even just a C note. Now you've turned an individual note into a whole harmony of notes that are being generated from that. And if you're playing two notes, you're going to be doubling or even tripling this. So you're, you're creating this hugely rich and complex sound with simple notes. You know, think about, um, on the other side of it, think about why when you play with a lot of distortion, a lot of the times uh, you don't want to play full-on complex chords with rich intervals. Well, that's because if you've got, you know, if this is what you're starting with, so, so Matt, this is what we started with, you run it through distortion, you get this. Imagine you start with this, a complex chord, and you multiply each one of these peaks with its own layer of harmonics. So this one is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, you know, 9, 10, 11 harmonics are being generated. Now take 11 and multiply each one of those by 11. And now you can quickly see how that's going to turn into a wall of sound where you've got a lot of notes that are clashing with one another, right? So maybe this harmonic generates one here. Well, what if this one generates one like slightly higher than this one and, and they're too close and they're dissonant with one another and they're clashing? That's why you play those complex chords with distortion and it can sound very unpleasant because you're, you're literally clashing the notes of the harmonies together. So now let's go back to our sine wave and just do we'll talk about one more thing. So we've talked a lot about distortion and harmonic additions, but let's talk a little more practically too about how it affects the feel of the sound. Okay, so here's going to be our clip. Consider also what happens in terms of the dynamics of what is going on. Well, first of all, you should be aware that when you clip this and this and this, the overall signal, the volume of this signal has gone down closer to zero. Your amplitude has shrunk. So when you talk about compression, that's exactly what we're describing here. Your dynamic range, the difference between your most positive and your most negative has, has shrunk down towards this middle line. So, you know, whenever you clip a signal, you are losing volume and you probably need to do some makeup gain. So if we go back to our tube screamer, you can see that, yeah, we've got this clipping stage. But we've got an additional volume stage here and we've got an output buffer here. And all that is going to help to make up what we have lost when we've clipped off some of the extreme parts of our sound wave. The next thing I want to point your attention to is this red wave in its pure form is basically spending its entire time either going up or down. It doesn't really spend any time staying stagnant. Well, now look at when we draw these lines. You're basically creating a point... So now the signal is going up, 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 completely stagnant. Now, the rate at which, right, so if I draw a little bit of a softer clipping, that's an important thing to think about. Certain ways of clipping the signal or certain types of diodes may soft clip, meaning this edge gets kind of rounded over. It's, it's a little bit more um, gentle. And actually, I think to make it more accurate, it would probably be on this side of it. So like that, that would be more of a soft clip. But then a hard clip is basically what I've got right here where this entire thing gets clipped off and it just hits this and bam, straight lines straight over like a sawtooth square wave. That is going to create a situation where you really have a 
tremendous amount of time now where the signal is staying stagnant at the same amplitude. It's not getting louder or quieter. It's just staying exactly where it is before now it goes down. And this whole time here, it's going to stay. Imagine if, if we clipped here and here. Now, the amount of time that the signal is going from positive to negative is so short compared to the amount of time that it is staying completely stagnant. So now we're introducing that this is the exact definition of compression. You know, the, the stagnant nature of the volume is staying completely still. It also means that you're going to have more sustain, right? Because your individual note no longer hits this quick, this transient up here and then quick goes down. That's the opposite of sustain. Now, when it hits this point, it sustains all the way over here before it starts going negative. And then hits this and it's, you know, it's, it's spending a tremendous amount of time being sustained at a, at a simple, straightforward volume. Whereas this, this red raw sine wave is basically hitting its peak and then instantly going back down. So it's not really sustaining at its maximum amplitude for very long. And so that's I, probably the next thing to be mindful of is when you distort or clip the signal, it's going to have a huge impact on your dynamics. So unless you have makeup gain to bring it back up, you're, you're going to have basically... Um, a much lower transient. So the transient is that, that immediate attack of when you play that note and it reaches this loudest peak. You're, you're going to have less of that and you're going to have more of the sustained signal, um, you know, the, the body of the signal, if you will, rather than just that initial punch. So if you consider, if you think about like a clean funk guitar part, it's basically all attack, right? The moment the pick hits the string and it sounds out the note, that's what you hear. It's clicky. It's percussive. Contrast that with Jimi Hendrix's fuzz tone, right? It's this, there's very little of that clicky percussive attack, and there's a tremendous amount of body and bloom and in this, in the sound just growing almost, um, as it as it gets clipped it really sharply and just holds through this area that's basically what you're hearing there so overall i hope you guys found this entertaining and enjoyable and also educational if you have any questions or comments please let me know down in the comment section below and if there's anything i messed up on please let me know and we'll make sure to get it corrected and if not i'll see you guys again soon thanks bye